the University of Phoenix is shelling out some big bucks. People often say that college is a scam. When they say this, they usually mean two things. One, they think that college is too expensive, or two, they don't think that college teaches enough relevant skills that are actually applicable to a job or career. But there's this one college called the University of Phoenix that's not just a scam figuratively or metaphorically, but literally. Now, for-profit diploma mills are nothing new but usually their scope and scale are relatively small. And the people who join these institutions are generally well aware of the shady status of the school. The University of Phoenix, however, isn't a shell company that's located in American Samoa. Instead, they actually have hundreds of massive locations across the US, including some of the most popular cities like Atlanta, Georgia, Austin, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, and of course, Phoenix, Arizona. They even had their own massive stadium. Seeing all this, you would think that the institution is very much legitimate. And technically, they are. At the peak, the university straight up had nearly half a million students, and the university also had plenty of distinguished professors to match. Basically, everything about the institution checks out, except for the fact that they're openly for profit. Now, if we're being honest, Basically, every institution is for profit, whether they like to acknowledge it or not. If they weren't, UT wouldn't have a $42.3 billion endowment, and Harvard wouldn't have a $50.9 billion endowment. Also, they wouldn't be paying football coaches magnitudes more than even their best professors. But that's for a whole nother video. The point is that while traditional institutions are also very much motivated by profits, there are certain lines that they won't cross simply to protect their reputation. Given that the University of Phoenix is openly for profit though, they don't really have a line. In fact, just recently, the FTC fined the university $50 million for their deceptive practices, which was dispersed to 147,500 of their students. And that was in addition to the university canceling $141 million worth of student debt. So here's the story of the world's most prolific for-profit institution and the various shady practices that they have leveraged over the years. Usually, when we take a look at the history of shady organizations, we'll see that they actually had wholesome beginnings and the University of Phoenix is no different. The university was established by a man named John Sperling who had a pretty humble background. John grew up in a tiny house in Missouri, and his parents were farmers and couldn't even make ends meet. So, there was really no expectation for John to go to college himself. In fact, no one in his entire family had gone to college. Nonetheless, the cards would fall in a way in which John would not only get a bachelor's, but a PhD in history from Berkeley. I don't think you'd be surprised to hear that he became a professor at San Jose State University shortly after. By all accounts, John had made it big. He had gone from being a no-name farmer in Missouri to being a respected professor in California. But John didn't fit in all that well with this new crowd. He hated many of his students as he felt that they didn't realize how privileged they were. Similarly, he hated many of his peers as he felt that they had become too comfortable and that they didn't try to incite change it despite having the power to do so. This hatred wasn't one way either as the university very much hated John as well given that he was always a troublemaker. John was literally the president of the faculty union, and he was constantly trying to defy the administration. Hearing all this, it's surprising that John stuck around till his 50s. But he did eventually hit his breaking point after a rejection from the state administrators. You see, John had been teaching a class for local teachers and police officers. And what he realized through this class was that there were plenty of working adults who wanted higher level degrees. So John wanted to design a program that targeted working adults, but the state administrators weren't exactly big fans of this idea. First of all, the idea was coming from John, who was a known troublemaker. And two, this school already had plenty of students, so they didn't really care about attracting more. John, however, felt that this was an example of the institution exercising classism. So he would leave his cushy job and start pitching the idea to other universities that were in desperate need of new students. And unlike San Jose State, these institutions would bite. John would go on to launch various programs at these institutions that would eventually become known as IPD. 
But accreditors weren't exactly big fans of this idea because IPD programs were designed to be for profit and had massive margins. But wait a minute, didn't John want to help lower class adults? Well, yes, but the only way that he could get these institutions to not only adopt this program but to actively care about and grow it was to offer profit incentive. But over time, the pushback from accreditors consistently became stronger and stronger. And eventually, John would be pushed to the conclusion that the only way that he could make this work was by starting his own institution. He didn't want to do it in California where the accreditors already hated him though. So instead, he moved to Arizona and established the University of Phoenix in 1976. The university was by no means a success from day one. In fact, it was very much a failure. During their first year of classes, the institution only had a total of eight students. A lot of this had to do with the fact that the university was unaccredited and had tight stipulations on who could apply. Initially, the prereq stipulated that you had to be at least 23 years old and already have some work and college experience. But as the institution gained accreditation and expanded into more populated areas, they saw greater success and would eventually even become profitable. But their biggest jump forward didn't come till 1989 when John began offering online programs. This made the university a pioneer in online education. And if you know anything about the 1990s, you know that investors very much had a sweet tooth for online products. So when the university's parent company, Apollo Education Group, went public in 1994, investors ate it up. Investor capital would allow the institution to grow faster than ever before, both physically and virtually. Their programs included business, education, health science, social science, and many more. They also offered all sorts of degree programs from associates and bachelors to masters and doctorates. The university would even expand internationally by opening a campus in Vancouver in 1998. All of this allowed the university to grow their enrollment to a total of 100,000 students by the end of the century. For perspective, even the largest public institutions in the US aren't able to reach such numbers. But it wasn't sunshines and rainbows forever. Investors don't invest in companies just for the fun of it. They invest to make profits. And investors don't just want profits, they want growing profits, which was especially true in the early 2000s throughout the dot-com crash. Given that the University of Phoenix was indeed a public company, one of their legal obligations was to address shareholder interests. And this is what would set off the painful decline for the University of Phoenix. The university didn't just jump into the super shady stuff straight up though. Like most things, their descent into the darkness was much more gradual, starting with much smaller infractions. For example, in 2000, they started to drift away from instructional hours. As you would guess, Paying a professor to teach a class is obviously not cheap. So the university started to sprinkle in some group study hours that would be counted as instructional hours. The university would end up being fined $6 million for this practice, but this was just the beginning. A few years later, two university recruiters would file a lawsuit against the institution for allegedly predatory recruiting processes. Allegedly, the university had been paying admission counselors based on the number of students that they enrolled which is actually a violation of the Higher Education Act. For obvious reasons, it's not a good situation when admissions counselors are incentivized to act for their own benefit instead of the benefit of the potential students. The university never admitted to any wrongdoing, but they did agree to pay a settlement of $67.5 million. It doesn't look like they changed anything after the settlement though, as they just became even more aggressive when it came to recruiting. The university precisely priced their degrees so that the entire cost of the degree could be handled by government grants and loans. This meant that basically anyone could afford to attend the school. But that was kind of also the problem. Basically anyone could afford to attend the school. This resulted in a bunch of people who weren't exactly academically inclined to join the school. These people had very little chance of actually getting through the coursework and obtaining the degree meaning that much of the effort that these students spent at the institution would be a complete waste. Yet, they were pushed by recruiters to join anyway, just so that the institution could earn more money from government grants. One group of people who have access to a bunch of government grants is veterans. And yes, the University of Phoenix would shamelessly target veterans. They would allegedly set up recruiting booths at military bases and promise the moon and more to these veterans. 
At one point, the school would even get banned from recruiting at military bases, but this wasn't until after the damage had already been done. During the worst of it, only 5% of students were actually getting a degree. This means that 95% had paid for nothing, or worse, they were paying back loans for nothing. Eventually, the FTC did step in it and get the university to partially refund 147,500 students and forgive some debt. But in the grand scheme of things, this is nothing. $191 million spread across 147,500 students works out to a mere $1,300 per student on average, which is nothing in comparison to the cost of tuition. So it looks like the vast majority of students will be left holding the bag. While the government wasn't able to do a whole lot about the situation, it looks like the media has. As more and more media outlets cover the institution and all of their shady practices, it appears that less and less people end up joining. In fact, enrollment has fallen off a cliff from nearly half a million in 2010 to less than 100,000 in 2020. This has forced the institution to scale back substantially. In fact, the university expects to only have one campus by 2025. They even had to give up their stadium, which has since been overtaken by State Farm. Looking forward, I suspect that this downtrend will only grow stronger. Here's the thing, even if all the reasons outlined in this video don't dissuade people from joining, one factor definitely will. Job prospects. Even if the professors, classes, and the courses are all stellar at the university, graduates would still have a tough time finding a job simply due to the terrible reputation of the university. If you have this institution on your resume, employers will almost definitely question your judgment and wonder why you joined a for-profit institution. So if you're looking to get a degree, this should probably be one of the top institutions that you avoid like the plague. But that's just what I think. Do you think that college in general is a scam? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you hope that the students get more restitution. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.